We're going to look at the elements and principles, the formal elements used in art, and then you are going to write a paper about a work of art. And rather than showing me a picture of the work of art, you're going to describe the work of art. You can describe the narrative, you can describe any stories that are in it, but you're also going to describe it formally as well. What sort of lines are in it? How are they using color? How is balance used? And we're going to go over that in two separate lectures. The first one being the elements or the ingredients. What are the basic things that we're looking at? And then after we look at those eight and nine elements, then we will look at the principles, which is how you assemble the elements to make good taste, to make a, uh, a nice harmonious picture. In abstraction, having a picture based on these formal elements is really most of what it's all about because you're not reading any stories of chivalrous knights or there's no fantasy images like Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. It's just simply how do these shapes, forms, colors relate to each other. So let's get into the elements first. So the visual elements, let me just check and make sure, okay. So the visual elements include line, shape, mass, which is also volume, light, line, shape, mass, light, value, color, texture, and space. Those are the basic elements or ingredients. We also, because of film, we have time and motion as well. So in other words, you can't understand a television show or a video or a film without a time elapsing. You can't just see it in one image. Like the painting, a single painting, you can understand what it is simply from the image. Single sculpture is the same way. But a film requires time, typically movement, for you to see how the whole thing fits together to tell the story that it's telling. We are going to isolate elements, but first I'm going to show you here in Elizabeth Murray's The Sun and Moon, which is oil on wood, how all of the initial eight elements are being used. Number one is line. So we can see that there are black lines on the blue pieces which are creating a visual texture maybe of a fence. We can see red lines in the pink figure that appears to be stepping over a cat that has a black outline in it. There are musical notes on the left and the right about midway down, halfway down in the overall composition and they appear to be musical notes and they have squiggly lines on the inside maybe implying noise, and then they have outlines, these black outlines. We can see a purple outline on the blue clouds in the top left. Plenty, plenty of lines. Shapes. Generally, when we talk about shapes, we talk about either geometric shapes or organic shapes or living shapes. So the geometric shapes typically circle, rectangle, square, and a uh, triangle. And we see a couple of triangles at the top of the composition. There are a couple of squares that are subdivided into either squares or rectangles in orange that might stand in for windows. We see rectangles making up what appears to be blue fences. Those are geometric shapes. The organic shapes like the clouds or what appears to be rain in blue, or the shapes that are describing music, or the pink shape of that person, or the orange shape with the cat that has triangles for ears. Mass. Because it's a painting, normally you only see illusory mass, illusory 3D space using linear perspective. And we generally reserve talking about mass for sculpture, too. 
I would say here there is a little bit of mass. And the reason I say that is that the shadows on the white wall are the result of being painted on wood. And in the places where there's empty spaces or negative spaces in the fence, in between the three notes and the musical notes, you will notice that the wall's value is changing from white to a mid-gray. And that that shadowing is increasing the sense of different shapes that we're finding. We can see in the top right in the fence where the squares, instead of having square white space, we see it subdivided into a different almost three quarters of that square being shadow or a mid gray and then little pieces of white. So there's a little bit of mass here, I think. Light, well, the way that light is being used is if light wasn't shining on this, it wouldn't have any color. So you need light or there would be total darkness. So we could say, yes, that light is involved here. And part of the reason I would say that light is involved is that there must be lights lighting this on the top because otherwise we wouldn't have the shadows at the bottoms of all of the three-dimensional wood pieces. And you can see that on every single piece that the shadows are not on the top of the forms, they're at the bottom of the forms, implying that light is being somehow shown up here and then creating shadows. A lot of times that's how you tell in a painting if there's light is by looking for shadows. Value means a, a sense of white on a scale all the way to black. And we can have a value scale in grayscale with light grays, mid grays, and dark grays. And then we could also say that these colors that we're looking at also have value in them. So it seems to me if we were to make a grayscale image here, I'm guessing that this yellowish green here is closer to white than this orange is. The orange appears to be a little bit darker. And I might even go to say that this blue might be the darkest value in the color system. Texture, there's two kinds of texture. Actual texture, like hair on a cat that you pet, or visual texture. And the visual textures here are in the clouds, I think in the straight lines that again seem to imply wood without actually having any knots or anything. The shapes and then the visual texture I think is implying some sort of wooden structure or fence or lattice. And then the space. We have a really compressed space of colors in here. And I missed color. So when we talk about color, we generally put it on a color wheel. It is generally on a value scale with yellow at the top and then the darker purple at the bottom. There are generally 12 hues. The primary hues are yellow, red, and blue. And the secondaries are made by mixing those colors to get green, orange, and purple. And we can see there's quite a bit of hues here. We generally divide color into warm and cool. Warm is the color of heat, yellow, orange, and red. And the orange is very, very warm here in the painting on this kind of cat-like figure that seems to be slithering out of this orange, I guess, window. The tail is over here in a kind of circular form. And then we have very cool colors in the fence. We have it in the musical note here. There's some purple back here, and we also see it in the light blue clouds as well. So cool colors are the color of grass, color of water, sky. When it comes to space, the last elements, as I said, we have a very compressed space with a number of different shapes here that are maybe even too difficult to figure out what they all are. We talk about space in relationship to positive space, that which is painted or drawn in or sculpted, and then the negative space, the spaces around it. And I think the negative spaces are really dynamic in this work because of all the hidden negative spaces in all the different pieces. So you can see 
all of the elements are at work in various degrees. Now, if we were to say what are the most intense of the ingredients here, I would say one of the first sensations is color, and then I would say the second sensation is probably line and maybe shape at kind of equal relationships. So how do we judge line? Strictly defined, a line is a path traced by a moving point. So from a point, you can create a line. Uh, words, each letter is a point, and then as you read each letter, you make a line. Line is synonymous with movement. So it's either moving vertically, it's either moving horizontally, diagonally, could be moving in spirals or other sorts of circular forms. In the sculpture on the left by Sarah Z, we see a sculpture made out of plastic circles. There is a measuring tape there, and it's very dynamic in terms of linear qualities. We kind of follow the yellow tape or the plastic as it goes back and forward in space. With a line, you generally follow it back and follow it forward in space. One great artist who used lines was Keith Haring. Keith Haring was a street artist in New York City in the 70s and the 80s. He dies young because of the AIDS epidemic and he was not able to be saved. He would go into the subways in New York where you have advertisements that when the subscription ran out, they didn't take out the advertisement. They would put black pieces of paper in case you wanted to review the subscription. So what Keith would do is go down with chalk and using outlines, thick distinctive outlines, he would draw these pictures that generally related to the advertising in some way, like the burning stinky money and all the people here reaching for it. You can see his work here, and I'm sure you probably recognize it. He is probably as popular as he's ever been. So contour lines and outlines. Outlines are what Keith is doing. He is defining the shapes with thick black lines. He's also defining movement with these curving lines. Here we're seeing people dancing around. In, with very bright colors and no chiaroscuro, no shading at all. A contour line is what we're seeing here with Pablo Picasso and his drawing of Igor Stravinsky. So yes, his lines do follow the shapes on the outside, but notice in the pants, the lines go inside of the outline following the contours of the folds in the clothes. So he is creating a three-dimensional form by not just using outline, but using contour lines. Lines also are used for direction and movement. I love this photo by Henri Carter Brisson. This photograph is showing us women who own a bakery in Italy we are standing where the camera is standing. Our eye is the camera's eye. And we are standing in the retail store. Down below us are women carrying freshly baked bread that come from the ovens across the street. So this store is probably so old that it has been there for a long time and it doesn't have ovens in the store. So each day they have to walk from the ovens to the retail space to sell their wares. He has caught what he calls a decisive moment. So we are getting movement and direction in lines here. Number one, look at the strong vertical lines that are taking us down in space and are anchoring this diagonal line here. As our eyes move along the line, we generally always go past the end of a line once our, we start moving. When we read a line of text, our eyes go past that line a little bit. So as this line continues, there are these women, and each one of them is a point. Point, 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 point. And then the little girls, point, point. And what we're seeing is we have an implied line that we psychically connect these points as a line, 
and our diagonal line that takes us back in space and directs our movement back in space takes us to here. And as we move here, we cross another really strong diagonal line that goes way back into the photograph. You can also see there's a line of people, a smaller line forming here. We also get this really interesting arc line as well. But I think the strongest line in the whole piece is going from here to here up to the front. So the line is taking us back into the photo, deep into the photo, and also bringing us forward at the same time. So directional lines are used to create movement with your eyes and a lot of times direct your eye how to see a composition. In Thomas Eakins' The Biglin Brothers, we get these really strong horizontal lines and horizontal shapes, almost like the cruise ship here is a outline and this is the inside of the line, like a Keith Haring drawing almost. Horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. And then notice in the shore, strong horizontal. The trees here, strong horizontal. A number of bands of kind of horizontal shapes. But we have a little bit of variety in here and the variety comes in the diagonals. When you start looking for the diagonals, you start to see it in the ore, you see it in the tree line, and you see it in some of the clouds, kind of breaking up the monotony of the horizontal line. In John and Toa Watteau, we see here a implied line. And just like the women that we saw in the bakery, we see a number of people here debarking a ship in a fet galant, a style of painting where generally it peaks in the Rococo era where we see rich nobility with lots of free time and extra spending cash and they go into these idealized gardens and natural settings because they are not stuck in factories and cities working for low wages. And they are generally going to have picnics, and those picnics usually are going to result in, if not flirtation, outright orgies. And that, I think, it might be implied happening here. Shapes. So as I said, shapes are two-dimensional forms identifiable boundaries. The boundaries may be made by a line, but also could be a shift in texture or a shift in color. Here we're seeing basic geometric shapes. Here we're seeing kind of organic shapes, and they have a very different feel. The organic shapes are natural and flowing and curving, typically irregular and asymmetrical and also associated with things from the natural world like plants and animals. Mass. So mass is a three-dimensional form that occupies a volume of space. We might speak of a mass of clay, a mass of a mountain, a mass of a work of architecture. Here, the laminated yellow cedar by Bill Reed, we are looking at the story of the raven and the first men. So this is an origin tale of the indigenous Haida people in the West, and their origin story is that they were stuck in a clamshell. They were afraid to come out into the world. And their spirit animal, a raven, coaxes them out of the shell and they begin to populate the world. If you only see the photo from the front, you don't understand really the entire sculpture. Notice in the back of the sculpture, this clutching arm, this face here, another upside down face, but really it's the texture and the shapes that are forming on the back of the raven that make the back of the sculpture kind of as interesting as the front of the sculpture. So when it comes to mass, when it comes to sculpture, you have to see it in the round. You have to see all the way, and a good sculptor will always give you something when you make sure to walk all the way around it. We also have things called implied shapes as well. They are not always shapes that are drawn in, but might be implied, and Salvador Dali was a master at that. Here, Mae West's face, a film star from the 30s and 40s, he is making an apartment with steps, wooden floor, 
a sofa made out of her lips. Her nose houses a alarm clock. And in the back, when you get up close to it, these are all oil derricks and oil fields. But from far away, where we're sitting in the photograph, they appear to be eyes. And it appears as if the wall is her wearing a mask. And it looks remarkably like Mae West, who he does make a sofa out of her lips. When it comes to light, I think James Turrell is one of the great artists. So James Turrell, he is a, an artist who works with light, and he makes these skyscapes. So in these skyscapes, he generally has an opening that you can see the sky. And the, the blue or the color of the sky, as it changes, sometimes that blue appears to be in the room with you. Sometimes that blue appears to be far, far away. And then the other thing that he does is he puts recessed lights in the white walls inside of the sky space, and they generally change color like the color wheel, from yellow to orange to red uh, into a purple, a green, a blue. And depending on the color and its warmth versus its coolness, you will notice that the light from the sky either appears very close to you or appears very far away. In his Gansfeld room, which uh, used to be at LACMA, I went several times to it, in the Gansfeld room, he has again made a white room for us, but the back wall is an optical illusion. The wall actually, there, this isn't the wall right here at the end of the floor. Actually, the floor, I think, drops down five or six feet, and I think it goes back about seven or eight feet. But because of how the lack of defined space as the color's changing, your eyes kind of hallucinate, and it's very hard to see the space very clearly. One of my favorite James Turrell's is his cube. I remember seeing the cube in a gallery for the first time and not knowing exactly what I was looking at. It looked like a cube made out of light was floating in the middle of the gallery. Once my eyes got adjusted, I realized that the cube was being projected into the back corner of the gallery, and he had managed to find a warm kind of light bulb that created a warm light that didn't recede back in space, but appeared to be moving forward. So James is one of those few artists where purely light is his medium. Often, though, we talk about light in terms of value, from white all the way to black on a gray scale. In many ways, it's how you judge a good black and white photograph, like this photograph here by Ansel Adams. It has an interesting value scale that is changing from white to black to white to black. So the sky is the lightest value here, the white light, but it's being reflected here in the water, and it's creating an interesting visual pattern. And then we also see light grays, dark grays, that also create a pattern that goes along with the white and the black and the white and the black. This is a Italian word, chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is a, um, is a technique for creating lights and darks. So this is uh, perfected in the Renaissance. We're looking at a Leonardo da Vinci here where he takes the paper and browns it out first. So he has not a white to draw on, but he has a mid-gray, which allows him then to use charcoal, and then he can use white chalk to draw in the highlights, more like painting rather than working on a white sheet of paper where you're just careful not to draw the highlights in. Here, we're seeing that smoky chiaroscuro that's giving us a sense of where light is hitting the face and then where the shadows are and the beautiful, soft, transitional spaces of those shadows. And you'll notice that he has very deep, rich values and light values in his chiaroscuro. He also makes very intense details, and he also leaves parts out 
And the parts he leaves out don't necessarily disappoint us in admiring it as a drawing. Color is the most emotional of all of the elements. Color is also on a value scale. You'll notice during the hot afternoons that we have this summer that the light will be white and it will create white highlights on things. Here in this Maxfield Parish, we are looking at a sunset more than likely. And in the sunset, the power of that white light has bent and now the highlights are becoming yellow. You'll notice there's no values lighter than the yellow. There can be no white because we don't have a white light. And we also, the way that we see, is when we have a warm light source like the sun or electric lights or candles, you have warm highlights, yellows and oranges. And you always, when you have a warm light, you have cool shadows. And you'll notice the shadows here on the vases, which are turning purple. You can also see it here as well. So it's Isaac Newton who passes white light from the sun and then bends it. And when it refracts, we get a prism. And he understands how the properties of color work. Color is refracted and bounced light that we see as various colors. So we have primary colors and pigments of yellow, red, and blue. You can't break them down to get other colors when you're painting or in colored pencils or in watercolor. And then if we mix yellow and red, we'll get orange. If we mix yellow and blue, we'll get green. If we mix blue and red, we get purple. Those are the secondary colors. Notice on the color wheel, the opposite of a primary is a secondary. You'll also notice that the opposite of a warm color is always a cool color. But the color wheel only shows you a small piece of how to see color. Every color has various forms of tints and tones and shades. The tints add white into a color and you can lighten the value scale all the way to white and you can also add black and darken a color all the way to black. You can add gray into colors and neutralize the colors from brighter to closer to gray or neutralize them typically when they're warm colors from brighter to closer to brown. This is how you master painting realistically is to understand all of the tints and the tones and the shades. There are also basic color harmonies. Single color harmonies on the color wheel, colors next to each other are known as analogous, complements are colors across from each other, and then on a 12-step color wheel, we have an equilateral triangle that forms triads. And then we can also get away from just two color harmonies that have high contrast and split either side of their complement into uh, single split complementaries or double split complementaries. These are what a couple of those basic color harmonies. And then there are hundreds and hundreds of other color harmonies colors that typically work together. You generally find more color with gray and brown in it mixes well with a little bit of bright color. More dark color mixes better with a little bit of light color. Here we have a monochromatic blue painting by Wies Klein. Here we have a painting that is fairly complementary with this yellow to maybe yellow orange to orange lemon here and it feels more towards orange because of all the blue. Analogous colors, colors next to each other on the color wheel, we have yellow, yellow, green, green, we have yellow, yellow, orange, orange, maybe red, orange, but notice that we don't have blues or anything. Here is a triadic in the proper harmony. You use a lot less of the lighter valued color, a lot more of the darker valued color. Also, if you want your tints or tones, if you want your neutrals to balance your bright colors, you have to have more surface area that is not color. And that creates a harmony where you see the whole thing as, as one, you see it as equal. The optical effects of color. So we can play games with how we see color 
by putting a yellow and a blue dot next to each other and stand back from it and we'll get greens. That's something that uh, Surratt is doing with pointillism where he is experimenting with a scientific way to see color by simply making dots. The interesting game here in also how we see color and why complements are so important is after image. So in this Jasper Johns painting, what I'd like you to do is to stare at this white dot for about five seconds. And then, as soon as you're done staring at it, look for the black dot here and see what happens. Ready? Start by looking at the white dot first. Ready? Go. Okay, now look down quickly. Did you notice that when you look down, the gray that's in here turns this gray into a red, it turns this area into a blue. So notice that we get the red, white, and blue, the white as the opposite of black, the red as the opposite of green, and the orange as the opposite of blue. And you'll notice that they're complements. So the reason you're seeing them as an after image is that your eyes are hardwired after they stare at a color to see the complement. So painting with a complement kind of satisfies the eyes automatically. We also can talk about color through the emotional effects. So brighter, warmer colors will agitate, softer colors will calm us. Here we're looking at a painting by Edward Munch, The Scream, where he is going through an existential crisis. The people he's walking with have walked ahead of him and the sky has turned blood red and his body has no definable anatomy. It's just simply a curve and we see him staring into space, um, this kind of strange, almost bodiless form. And we don't know exactly what he's looking at, whether it's an interior or if there's something off the frame but there's a lot of emotion packed into this. A different kind of emotion is in this uh, uh, James Abbott McNeil Whistler painting, Nocturne in Blue and Gold, where rather than a warm light that is gonna give us cool shadows, we are getting a cool light, like you have uh, right before the sun comes up and also when the sun goes down. So when you have this cool light, your highlights are warm, like this blue guy here, and your shadows are warm. So you have cool highlights because a cool light source, which gives you warm shadows, which is the opposite of generally how things go, where when you have a white light, you have white highlights and cool shadows. So the opposite happens with the cool light, and you can see how warm the shadows are here. Actual and visual texture. So Merritt Oppenheim's Luncheon and Fur, we see a fur-covered cup, saucer, and spoon, and it's very pretty. You want to touch it. It's a real texture. You wouldn't want to drink out of it, though, um, but you would like to touch it. If you think about drinking milk out of this, it seems kind of disgusting, right? There's a reason for that. I'll talk about that in a different lecture. Visual texture, like in the Van Gogh painting, is created by using shape or color or thickness in paint to give us a scent here with these lines that he's using, which, which appear to be dark greens and blues that are giving us a sense of leaves and a very strong texture. Pattern is any decorative or repetitive motif or design. Pattern can create visual texture, although visual texture may not always be seen as a pattern. Patterns often have maybe geometric qualities to them or some sort of grid that we can define. Here, Samuel Faso gives us a visual buzz of spatial ambiguity by giving us so many different patterns, we maybe start to lose sense of space. I think also what's interesting in this is we appear to have kind of these futuristic glasses, maybe old skins, clothes of the past, and contemporary shoes. It's almost as if this picture is in a time frame of past, present, and future all at once. Space. 
So the space in and around an artwork is not just a void, it is very much there. And sometimes artists will use that empty space to make work. Like this is the empty space underneath his chair that he casts in cement. Or here, we are looking at a vase. But when you look at the negative space, you notice a forehead, a nose, a mouth, and a chin. And it appears like this piece is hanging in the brain. Here again, we see a forehead, a nose, a mouth, and a chin. And again, something hanging in the brain here. The profile is of artist Marcel Ducamp. He's the guy that we talked about in an earlier lecture that did the urinal, great Dada artist. He is going to do a number of artworks that we will be looking at that I think are very important. Now, making space. There is actual three-dimensional space that sculpture typically implies. There can also be illusory space as well. So here in Doho Su's reflection, we see an actual sculpture of an arch from his hometown in Korea that is upside down, implying as he's in New York that it's in the other side of the world. And when you stand in the right spot, the light in here and the fabrics reflect in such a way to create this entire elliptical shape here, and we get the illusion of the arch here and the real arch here. And the difference between the illusion and the real is really fascinating when they line up. Making the illusion of depth in painting. So one of the first ways that you do it is by size. So the biggest things are closest to you, like the farmer plowing here. And then this guy who's a lot smaller with his walking stick, he's implied to be far away. And then notice that our farmer is bigger than the sailing ship, which probably if it was close would be much bigger, but it's implied along with this ship as it gets smaller that it must be further away from us, creating a sense of space. I love the landscape with the fall of Icarus. We see Icarus who built wax, his dad Daedalus built wax wings to fly to heaven, got too close to the sun and fell here into the water. And what's funny is, is this guy has fallen from the sky probably to his death and the farmer does not care. This is a painting that is a saying um, in Dutch society that goes dot, 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 and the farmer plowed. It kind of contemporary means, yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, I don't give a shit. I got to plow. I got to get I got to get the seeds in. I got to get harvest. I can't be bothered with some guy falling. I think it's kind of funny. Now, another way to make depth and not use any change in the scale or size is to overlap. So by overlapping, we get a sense of space and also by vertical location. The bottom of the canvas is closest to us and the top of the canvas is furthest away. A real breakthrough in space for painters came in the 1400s when Filippo Brunelleschi invented linear perspective. He noticed that parallel lines converge at the horizon line. He noticed also that the, uh, the grid that he created could be set up to create a sense of larger objects in the bigger parts of the grid, smaller objects in the back of the grid. And using this, he could create believable 3D space. Because again, parallel lines appear to converge at a horizon line. So he is setting up vanishing points, creating grids. And that's where we see a lot of this early Renaissance paintings um, that are, this particular fresco is in the Sistine Chapel. Foreshortening is another way to create three-dimensional space. So it's easy to do three-dimensional space when the figures or the objects are standing perpendicular to you, or parallel to you, I mean. But what happens if Christ's feet were closest to us and his head was further away? Well, what would happen is we get this sense of foreshortening. So here we see the dead Christ with his feet closest to us, and what they've done is they've really shrunk the legs and then we don't see parts of the upper chest and the neck that gives us a sense of three-dimensional space. 
you can see the same thing happening here as well. Atmospheric perspective is something you see every day. So in atmospheric perspective, things in the distance appear to be bluish and their darks are a very light gray in terms of value. So the mountains that surround us in California from far away look blue. And the reason is, is that blue is a short wavelength, red is longer, and blue appears to scatter. So as you get further away, the blue light scatters and it kind of makes everything bluish. And we call that atmospheric perspective. Another way to make perspective is isometric perspective where we don't converge our lines. The lines simply stay parallel going back in space. You'll find video games that use this. And also other forms of Moogle art and Moogle painting will also do the same thing. So our sense of space again relies on vertical location or overlapping to get a sense of space. And then the last of the, the ninth ingredient or the ninth element is time and motion. So this is Jennifer Steinkamp. This is a digitally made video of trees in a dervish or in a wind. And you get a sense from this dervish. So notice that there's movement that's happening. And the movement is done by animating each one of the frames. And the movement is a little bit hypnotic as the tree is twisting back in space almost to the breaking point and then it twists back. And as you sit and watch it, you begin to get a sense that what's important in this artwork is not just the still frame of the tree itself, but the hypnotic sense of the movement is really the key in understanding the artwork. And that would be true in video, in film, and in television. Our second lecture are the principles of design. There's a f not as many of these. So the principles are how you put the elements together. And these principles include unity and variety, kind of on a sliding scale. Variety draws interest. Unity kind of gets everything to fit together. And then we have balance, both symmetrical and asymmetrical. We measure balance on an imaginary vertical line in the middle of a composition. And if it's equal on either side, we call it symmetrical. And if it's different, it's asymmetrical. Usually in asymmetric balance, you want bigger objects like the giant head of the boy sweating here. You want that near or overlapping the vertical line and then smaller objects near the edge of the frame that create a sense of asymmetrical balance. We also have focal points known as emphasis, the boy's head here, and then subordination, smaller things that we have to really look and find rather than the thing that is jumping out at us. We also have proportion and scale. So you'll notice that the boy's head is out of proportion. It's too big for his body. We often look at proportion in terms of perfection of the body or perfection of the architecture based on mathematical proportion, which comes from the Greeks. And then we also have scale. Scale typically is measured by human scale, so smaller than human form or bigger than human forms. And then we also like to set up all of our elements in an interesting way that's pleasing to the eye, and we call that rhythm. The rhythm could be the rhythm of the circular shapes that are in the Clayton Brothers' two four-foot by eight-foot wood panels here. And the rhythm could also be looking at how various colors, like the greens, are working across the canvas or the wood as well. So unity and variety. Unity is a sense of oneness, things belonging together, making up a whole, and variety is difference. Unity, too much unity can be bland, too much variety can be chaotic. Here's an Henri Matisse. We have gouache on paper that's cut and pasted and charcoal on the white paper. So the empty space here helps to organize these shapes. The shapes are organic and the shapes are also geometric. 
the shape that our eyes begin at is the big shape that crosses the imaginary center axis, A-X-I-S. That imaginary axis, we find the shape that is either rising or falling in space. If it's rising, we might go, our eye might go from here to the red shape and then over to these organic shapes around this curve, kind of taking us around the space. We can also see this as a falling space and then take our eye into the negative space that organizes it and we can work our way through the canvas. Here in Jackson Pollock's Shimmering Substances, we get unity from the short strokes that kind of weave together all the different colors and shapes. We can also have conceptual unity as well, like we have in Joseph Cornell. With Cornell, he contains boxes within boxes. Each one of the boxes have their own kind of private world, and he selects and arranges these objects to have conceptual meaning to him based on nostalgia, dreams, and fantasies. Here in Los Angeles, in front of the LA County Museum of Art, we get a strong sense of unity from the assemblage sculpture of Chris Burden. Chris collected these gas lamps and then he organized them with equal space between them, but they go from tallest in the middle to shortest on the outside. And although they appear to be similar when you first look at them, as you begin to look at the bases as you begin to look at the capitals especially, you notice that the lamps are different from row to row. They are not exactly the same. And then you also notice that some of the flourishes at the capitals are kind of similar to the palm fronds in the Robert Irwin artwork that is all the trees and how they're planted in the back. Irwin also did the garden at the Getty Museum. When we talk about balance, we're generally talking about the visual weight on the left and the right side in a canvas, or in this case, around the sculpture. The balance here in Noguchi's red cube is so perfectly placed, you don't feel too uncomfortable walking around it or under it because it doesn't seem precarious in terms of falling. In symmetrical balance, you get equal space, and M.C. Escher here is known for his symmetry based on tessellations and tiles. So the left-hand side of this etching is, the, the woodcut I mean, is also the same as the right. He's only switched the values, but everything else is similar. I highly recommend watching the video here to see uh, how balance works. So symmetrical balance, equal from, here's our center axis, equal on the left and the right. Here, this would be unbalanced and be visually heavier over here. However, if we move this large person near the center of the seesaw, it will appear to be balanced, and this would be an example of asymmetry. We also have something called relaxed symmetry. On the surface, this George O'Keefe appears to be symmetrical, but you'll notice how the tree moves off the center axis and then regains its balance from the branch and also from the atmospheric perspective of the mountain in the background in asymmetrical balance. So the balances that we're finding here in these illustrations. Number one, this maybe appears to be a bit unbalanced. The large form is heavier than the smaller form. Also here, each of these shapes is equal from the axis line, and it appears that the dark shape is heavier than the light shape. The textured shape, heavier than a smooth shape. A more complex shape, heavier than a similar valued smooth shape. Here, we do have balance. So, whereas I would say the first four are not balanced, the two smaller shapes here equal the bigger shape here. And again, similar space from the center axis line. Also, we could say that this smaller, darker shape is balancing out this larger, lighter shape because again, when the darker value is the same size, the darker shape will appear heavier. Here in Gustav Klimt's Death and Life, 
we have a light object here, a light configuration that runs over the center axis line and is balanced by the smaller, darker shape that is on the edge of the frame here. If they were both equally placed, they might have a different sense of balance. But here, we're balancing the larger shape near the center, the smaller shape near the edge, like our seesaw. And notice that the two halves are conceptually tied together by death and the implied line of death looking at the woman and her baby, kind of tying the whole image together. I love this painting. Emphasis and Subordination, the banjo lesson by Henry Oswa Tanner. Such a sweet painting. So here we get an emphasis of the man and the boy because it's the largest object, it's in the center of the frame, but also the value patterning from the light source coming off of the canvas goes from white to black to white to black to white to black. And that pattern of white to black is much more dynamic than the objects that are closer to us here, these two jugs, which are simply a dark value or one light and dark value. The other couple of things that I think are brilliant in this painting is how he takes these two objects nearer to us and subordinates them by keeping them in the shadow. And notice that the shadow runs off the frame of the canvas and comes back here and that we get this rectangular shape kind of framing in the man and the boy. He also subordinates the back of the room by using atmospheric perspective. So by bluing out the shadows, not having them black, the lighter values here and the atmospheric perspective also is not as dramatic as the full range of value from white to black, and it subordinates the background and doesn't get in the way. Technically, I think it's a brilliant painting. Scale. So again, scale have to do, uh, proportion and scale have to do with size. Scale is the size in relation to standard or normal size. So here we're getting large scale feet and legs coming out of the ceiling and very small scale people who the foot from the large scale a leg is creating a shadow because it's lit from the back. And in that shadow we can see where people are about to get stomped. Zhai Go Chang, he used fireworks to create giant footprints for the beginning of the opening ceremony for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. So when the fireworks explode and form a footprint, it's as if there's an invisible sky god marching his or her way into Beijing Stadium to start the Olympics. Here we see the sense of scale on Klaus Oldenburg's kind of whimsical plantoir where it's so big it looks like a fairy tale giant just left this here. In proportion, often proportion has to do with numerical relationships. Pythagoras is the inventor of musical scales and the Greeks love the idea of proportion. We get proportion here in the hand with the Fibonacci sequence, and we also find the Fibonacci spiral that forms from a rectangle that is divided into squares with no remainder in it. That golden rectangle, that golden spiral, we also find in various forms of architecture too, like in the Parthenon. Here with Leonardo da Vinci, he is playing around with basic geometric shapes and he is looking at human proportions according to an ancient Roman writer and a architect named Vitruvius. And da Vinci is using the belly button to create this perfect circle here. And you'll notice that the belly button is not the midway point of the body. The midway point of the body is the pelvis. But by putting the circle here, we can see how he's using the circle and then he's offsetting the square and implying that the feet and the arms reach the edge of the square. You can also play around with proportion too. 
So you might have proportion as perfectly mathematical, or here, René Magritte, he's playing around with the expectations of proportion in the surrealist work. We also see at various times in history proportion relating to beauty. So beauty as it relates to the female form in just a couple of examples. On the left in the Renaissance, the perfect form of the woman was always one that had a belly. And we will see and have seen um, paintings that show us women who appear to be pregnant. That's not always the case, but that was considered to be kind of the perfect, beautiful form of a woman, a woman who looks pregnant. In the middle image by Peter Paul Rubens, we find where it was very fashionable and very beautiful to show women with lots of flesh on themselves. And then that ultimately changes probably in the 1960s with fashion models, and in particular, the image and photo of the model Twiggy. And Twiggy created a new archetype of woman who had no curves and no fat on her at all and was considered beautiful on the runway and in fashion photography for a long time. Rhythm. So rhythm is based on repetition. It's a basic part of the world we find ourselves in. We speak of the rhythm of the seasons, which recur in the same pattern every year, the rhythm of the cycles of the moon, the rhythm of the waves upon the shore. We see here waves made out of soil in Myelin's Storm King wave field and natural rhythms of the passing of time. So we might look at the rhythm of how the yellow birds are put together in the Paul Clay or the silvery shapes or the way that the red organic, our eyes kind of move around, finding these patterns, these rhythmic movements. And again, this rhythm can often be a fluctuation or a variation marked by regular reoccurrences, like the rhythm of the haystacks that are here, going back in perspective, or the rhythm by the dancer's legs that are forming, as well as the rhythm being formed by the colors and the lines, and the repeating kind of stylization in the lines as well. Last slide, elements and principles, a summary. So this is Pablo Picasso, 1932, Girl Before a Mirror. We are looking at a canvas that has near symmetry. The mirror that the girl is looking at, that vertical line on the left, is the midway point, or about the midway point, vertically, the center axis. The shape of her head, which is kind of circular, is nearly balanced on the left and the right. It's a lighter form on the left, a darker form on the right. He's using lines, black lines and green lines. He's using basic shapes, geometric shapes for the most part. And he's also using color, yellows and greens and reds. We find color, we find line, we find geometric shapes in here. We find also uh, principles that include near symmetry. We find a sense of rhythm in terms of how the shapes are all fitting together. And we get no real sense of emphasis. Everything is kind of equal here because all the colors are just as bright. There's no atmospheric perspective. There's no neutral grayed out colors. So there's a strong sense of pattern and rhythm in this piece. So notice what I did is I used some of the major principles and some of the major elements that are in here to begin to describe this. What I would like you to do is an even better, more thorough version of this. I would like you to write a paper about a single work of art. I don't want you to write a paper about an artist and all of their art, but I want a single work of art. So you are going to pick a work of art and write about it, and then in your first paragraph, you tell me who the artist is, any information that you know about the artwork. In the second paragraph, completely and effectively describe the work of art using the elements and principles. That's what I'm mostly going to be grading on and the fact that you can use proper grammar and also that uh, you can write in paragraphs. In the last paragraph, 
I'd like you to tell me why you picked this particular work of art rather than some, oh, how does this affect you? And so this paper is going to be one to two pages, and you will be critiquing the work of art through the formal elements. Are they pleasing? What do you like about these elements? And also, can you use the elements to effectively transcribe what this painting looks like? And you're going to find that it's hard. It's very hard to use words to equal something that is a visual. Um, but we do that all the time. That is what historians do. And you're always, that's what art critics do. They're trying to describe a work of art as effectively as you can. And you are going to use the elements and the principles to try to do this. I hope you have a good time with the work of art. I look forward to seeing your papers, and I'll talk to you soon.